Are you all familiar with the flyways that connect the Arctic to the South America? The flyways are where the birds migrate and the butterflies migrate. If there's migrating animals, this is where they go. And the birds that winter here are from as far away as the northern Arctic. And we're a major stopping point, this marina, or this marina and the, and the wetlands. Um, tens of thousands of years, these birds have been coming here. And when I look at this, these red lines, I don't see them as lines, I see them as a string of pearls. Mm -hmm. Now that string of pearls is 95% gone. We're facing the sixth mass extinction. This is what happens when there are no birds to migrate. Birds have a very important service that they provide. They provide fertilizer. They provide um, uh, seed disbursement. They provide food for other animals. They um, uh, prune. Uh, they eat insects. They keep the other plants in balance. They, um, they prune the plants because of their nesting. And so they have a very important and vital role. And what they need is disappearing. We've lost 70% of the seabirds in the past 50 years, in a lifetime. Now geologically, these birds have been doing this for tens of thousands of years. 50 years is like the blink of an eye in geological time. It's, we're facing the sixth mass extinction, as I said, and this story is about how it happens right under our noses. You know, if you think about the sixth mass extinction, it just seems too big to wrap your brain around. It's too much. But what this project has shown me is how it's happening little by little, every day, right in front of our noses, and, and we haven't done anything about it. But we can. So when I showed this to, I showed this to several groups, and the first group was um, Fish and Wildlife and Beaches and Harbors. And as we came out of it, um, Brody, the manager of the wetlands, the Biota Ecological Reserve, went, ugh, oh, it's like death by a thousand cuts. Hmm. And I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that quote, because it's true. And um, so let's go ahead. Now the original wetlands, and many of you already know this, but I just wanna kind of frame what I'm gonna show you in the context of geological history. The wetlands was clear up into Venice, up here, the marina. And again, think in terms of DNA. These brutes have been coming here tens of thousands of years. This is what they think of as the wetlands, not what we think. You know, we, we were talking about the development in the marina, which literally most of it has happened. Uh, the hardcore development has happened in the last 60 years, which is like that for these birds. Um, and right, and clear up into Sentinella. The black lines are what remain as a reserve. And, and they're not functioning very well as the wetlands because they're so polluted due to the abuse that's happened over the last hundred years. That's another topic, not for today, but again, this is, and the birds don't know this is where they're supposed to be. <laughs> they, they think all of this is where they're supposed to be. So that is part of the hook, line, and sinker dilemma. So, um, over 70% of the original Habitat has been destroyed. What's left is, is under tremendous um, pressure. The ecological functions are extremely suppressed. And although there's a lot of variety, I, I've been astounded that in a fairly short amount of time, I've been able to capture, just with birds alone, not alone mammals and insects and reptiles and all these other things, just birds alone, probably 80 to 100 species. I still see new things every time I go out. But what I also have realized is there's not very many left of each kind. I mean, it's, and I'm, even in the past three years, I've seen diminished because of the drought compounded with habitat destruction and on and on. So I'm watching it decline even in the last three years. And again, it's not scientific. 
It's just observation. I would love to get data on it, but that's the, one of the next steps I'll talk about. And of the birds that remain, the seabirds that remain, many of those are expected to be extinct within the next 40 to 50 years. That means we've lost almost all of our seabirds. It's Okay, but hopeful vigilance. I have hopeful vigilance. Um, although they're, the conditions are very fragile and very tenuous, uh, mitigating, mitigating these stressors and getting the remaining wetlands back to their original ecological functions will be, and it will be fraught with challenges. However, it's not, not doable. We can do something about it. Once these are restored, even a little bit at a time, it's going to need vigilant monitoring and ongoing modifications to make sure that we provide enough food and shelter for the wildlife to survive and persist, and protection from intentional and unintentional harms of, of human activity. In other words, our pearl, because I consider this a pearl in that string of pearls, is going to be a life support for the foreseeable future, and we need all hands on deck. I think it's very, very urgent. So the extreme stressors are pretty well known. There's political economic pressure. Um, there's severe environmental degradation. We know this. There's increasing impacts from climate change and sea level rises. And there's harmful urban recreational activities. And it's this last one that seems to be the most, the simplest. And that's where I'm going to start. So, I want to start with recreational shore fishing. Um, this shore fishing has caused significant, and I, do, I think it's unintentional harm, not only to the wildlife, but the habitat that the wildlife need for feeding purposes. And, this, and, it, and the story reveals how <coughs> recreational fishing contributes to the phenomena of mass extinction right under our noses. And um, it's about the survival of our wetlands in the adjacent areas, and how we can what we can do to mitigate harm and destruction to the food supplies for wildlife, identify education and outreach solutions uh, that are a little outside the box. I want to do some outside of the box thinking with this. And by supporting and participating in reviving its ecological functions and mitigating further harm. And so, are you ready to meet some of your neighbors? And many of you are going to be already familiar with this, so I. I'm, I apologize for any redundancy, but um, I'm going to dive into it, but I also want to tell you because I'm very focused just on the jetties and the, and the creek right now, um, and the lagoon. Uh, most of their bird food comes from mussels, clams, oysters, small fish, crustaceans, and, and the other creatures that live along the jetties and the levees. And tiny, tiny snails, tiny crabs, but most of all fish and more in the Delray Lagoon, the creek, the salt pan, the marina, and the beach waters. Because again, the birds don't know they're supposed to stay inside that fence. <laughs> they're looking for food everywhere. And the same birds, you'll see them. You'll see them in what has been developed in the last five years, the uh, campus at Playa Vista. You'll st still see them trying to forage over there, although there's nothing left to forage. You'll still see them in the marina. You'll still see them on the beaches. You'll st still see these same birds everywhere. And the aquatic plants and insects and frogs and reptiles and other small mammals. Okay, so these are buffalo heads. Beautiful. There aren't any around right now as near as I can tell. I don't, Jonathan, have you seen any? Yeah, they've all migrated. And it's so ex Winter is the best time to come walk in the lagoon and along the, the creek because you, and, and around in the freshwater marsh, because you will see these and you'll see so many different species. They're just beautiful. Um, their migration path has started, they start arriving in October and head north to Alaska and Canada and towards Quebec and in the mountains in Washington State, northern US. And they forage mostly underwater um, and feed on crustaceans and mollusks and, um, and some plant varieties. The loons, also, they start arriving in November and head north in early, early spring. This year I saw a family of 
six arrive, um, that they pretty much hung out together. Um, there might have been more, but those are the ones that I observed. And um, they start arriving in November and they head in early spring to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and throughout northern Canada and Greenland and Iceland. And um, some of them uh, come down to Montana and Massachusetts too. And they forage underwater and their legs are so strong they can dive underwater 200 feet and they feed mostly on fish. So not only are they beautiful, but they're athletic. Mm -hmm. uh, Red-breasted merganser. Oh, this was, I'm sorry, common loons. The six that I saw, this, the family of six that arrived were actually the mergansers, my, my mistake. Um, and their migration path, they breed in wood, wooded lakes and tundras in southern Alaska and across Canada and Newfoundland. But in the winter, they come south to here, and they're just beautiful birds. And, and feed on fish, primarily. Um, the surf scooter is um, very beautiful. This is a male and a female. And there, there's quite a few of them uh, in the winter here. And there's, there's not as many as they were two or three years ago, but they're, they're still coming. And they breed on ponds in the bo uh, boreal forest in Alaska, Labrador, and Newfoundland. So they, they go pretty far north. And they diet on mollusks below the low tide line, primarily. This long-tailed duck, this is on Audubon's list of common birds in steep decline. What that means is they think it's going to be extinct within the next 30 to 40 years. Beautiful, beautiful bird. I saw it come through in last fall, and I saw it come through this spring, but I didn't see it in the winter. Did anybody else? I, th I think it must go further south for the winter. Um, but beautiful, very unusual. And their diet is mollusks, shrimps, crabs, and in the winter, and then when they nest up north, uh, they feed on their diet changes to roots, buds, seeds, and insect larvae. Western grebes are really beautiful, um, and they come they breed in British Columbia. There's still some that are here year-round, but few, far fewer. Just, just maybe a handful are here year-round. But um, they uh, breed in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Minnesota. And again, they eat mostly fish, some crustaceans, insects, worms, and salamanders. And they also eat feathers. I found this kind of interesting, which catch fish bones by preventing them from moving into the digestive system. And here's another type of grebe, grebe, the eared grebe. And for the first time, I saw one in breeding plume this spring. I don't, it should have been north by now, but I guess it's sticking around. I hope there's a female here. Um, and they breed in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Minnesota. So these birds are coming for a long way to be here in the winter. I just find that really remarkable. And pied-billed grebes, they're, their babies look, they, they hang out, you'll see them in the creek, but they're primarily in the freshwater lagoon. But again, uh, their babies are kind of comical looking. And there are some year-round in the marsh. Um, again, they breed in British Columbia, Saskatchewan. And they eat on fish, crustaceans, and insects. Now the comorants are here year-round. They have a, there's a breeding colony. Is, does, how many people know where that breeding colony is? Okay, it's, if you take Bora Bora, which is over there, um, off of Via Marina, I think, is the street, and take it to the end, you'll be in a parking lot, and if you take the parking lot around towards the marina channel, you'll see another tiny parking lot with the, a park, and you can't miss this tree. Um, it is, oh, let me switch here. This is, I mean, this is, the, the thing that's so ironic about this is there's a tree that's just laden with these nests, 
and it's high density nesting just right next to high density housing. <laughs> and guess who was there first? Um, but anyway, here's to show you that it's truly a village. There's babies, the mom's regurgitating so that she can, can feed them. Here's some of the babies in, in their nests. Here's a handsome fellow in breeding plumage. Beautiful. And then here's an ancient one that I didn't see when I was taking this picture. But when I brought it back, I thought it was a leaf or something, and I zoomed in, I went, oh my god, that guy's old. <laughs> so, this is multi-generational housing. Um, and at dusk, you can also see them roosting along the creek in, in some of the high trees there. But they're, they're, I really encourage you to go see the colony. And I don't know where else they nest, but that seems to be the main place. And, Okay, the great egrets. Again, they, the great egrets, the snowy egrets, and the black crowned night parents, which I'll show you, all nest in. And again, these birds are all over the marina, and they hang out a lot out by the jetties and, and along the levee of the creek. So, fish eating birds, all fish eating birds hang out there. But I wanted to show you that these birds are here year round, and they're so beautiful. But, um, so they eat primarily fish, but they'll, they'll, if they get hungry, they'll eat whatever they can. Um, what I didn't realize I, as I was doing research for this project is Audubon Society, everybody familiar with Audubon? They were founded to protect birds like the great egrets from being killed for their feathers. That's their logo is this bird because that's one of the things. The feathers were being used for hats. And so that's why they're the symbol for the National Audubon. And they can be spotted throughout the wetlands, freshwater marsh, the creek, and et cetera, and along the riparian corridor. And one of the things, oh, actually, let me go back. This, this one was along the creek. I took this picture over at the riparian corridor right adjacent to where what's called Silicon Beach is. Do you guys know where that is? The campus at Playa Vista? So these birds are still trying to forage over there. But there's not much left. But they're still trying because they don't, they don't know what happened. <laughs> um, they also, these, these babies here, it must have been one of their first times leaving the nest because they were looking really distraught up at the tree trying to figure out how to get back up there. <laughs> and this little guy was just hiding in the grass going, I don't know what to do. So anyway, and then these guys, when they come to the nest, they have an elaborate dance they do to recognize each other because they, otherwise they don't recognize each other. They have to share a dance. So I thought that was kind of a fun shot. And of course the snowy egrets. They nest on Marquesi's way. And I hope everyone goes over and looks at the nesting site. Right now is a good time at dusk and dawn because there's a lot of juveniles that are leaving the nest and coming back, and they do that at dawn and dusk. And so it's noisy, it's, it's just an amazing scene. There's 13 trees, and a couple years ago I counted between 55 and 60 active nests. And these are not small birds, these are big birds, so it's, it's, a, it's a rumble at night. So, and one of the things that we can do, uh, I think Kathy was talking about outreach, is there's a lot of complaints for the, from the apartment dwellers that live adjacent to these 13 trees. And they complain about, oh, they're messy, they're poopy, they're noisy. If they could realize what a gem they're living next to, out of all of LA, how rare it is, that they get to live next to these and watch the cycle of life happen. Mm -hmm. That would be a good community outreach. Have, um, as people move in, have a little welcome packet. Look what you get to see every day. Nobody else gets to see this. It's just here. You know, so those kinds of things would be good outreach, I think. One of the things I wanted to point out is the Delray Lagoon. Does everyone know where the Delray Lagoon is? Yes, yes, okay. It's a saltwater lagoon that ebbs and flows with the tide. It empties and it fills up. And how it does that 
and it goes through the, the creek is what helps it empty and flow. There's a big conduit between the lagoon and the creek, and this is that conduit. This is a main feeding area for many of these fish-eating birds, which is the only birds I'm showing you are the fish-eaters, um, because as it, the lagoon fills up, if there are fish around, they get sucked in to the lagoon. And as the tide goes out, again, the fish are getting sucked out, so it's very easy pickings for these guys. <laughs> and so you, that's a really good spot, place to spot great blue herons, egrets, comorants, um, a lot of the other diving ducks that I showed you, they all hang out there. Okay, and again, here's babe, another juvenile in a nest. Not quite as clear. Um, great blue herons are another one that live here year-round. They're on the Audubon red list, red watch list. Um, sad to say, campus at Playa Vista, I saw this magnificent bird at the top of a fence looking down at a sandy volleyball field going, you know, I think there was food here last year. I don't. So, I mean, in three years, foraging areas are just wiped out. Fifth mass, mass extinction. Or sixth, I'm sorry. Again, the great blue heron nests are about 50 pounds each. Huge. They're, they don't nest as densely as the comorants do, but they nest in the areas adjacent to where the comorants are. So you see the comorants also start looking for these great blue heron nests. And they're in that park and they're some uh, dozen or more trees in Mar Mariner's village. But you, you just have to look up and see these huge nests. This guy was in the salt pans. And I was watching him for about 10, 15 minutes. And he was fascinated with this stick. He'd pick it up and throw it down. And then he'd just look at it. And he'd pick it up and he'd throw it down. And then he'd look at it. And then he'd flip it over and throw it down. And I said, what is he doing? So I, again, I went back, researched what he was doing. Apparently the males go get the sticks that are applied to the nest. But the female back home at the nest gets to approve whether it comes in or not. So he was, he was doing a little testing before he took the stick back, and he took the stick back. And then there's just a, a baby looking out with a parent over, overlooking it. Okay, these are the beautiful black crown night herons. Um, they are, again, they nest in Marquesas, but they're often in the creek. The juveniles are starting, you're starting to see the juveniles during the day, even at night, come feed in the creek, in the freshwater marsh, in, in, sometimes on the beach, in the marina. Um, so these are some other year-round visitors. And they primarily eat fish, but they eat all kinds of things. They're, they eat the mussels, they eat clams, fish, amphibians, lizards, they, they like it all. Okay, and here's some youngsters, again on Marquesas Way. This is a juvenile. This is one that's a little bit younger, kind of a little bit fuzzy down, hasn't quite left the nest yet, and then a parent guardian. Brown pelicans. These are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, the sad thing about the pelicans, um, most of the California pelicans, uh, 80 to 90 percent, they nest in Mexico, but there is a breeding colony in California on the Channel Islands. And um, since the 80s, the populations have continued to increase. However, and as you know, they, in the 70s, I think it was, they almost went extinct due to pesticides. And so they've kind of come back slowly. And then um, supposedly they have about 4,600 nesting pairs as of 2014 when I was doing the research. Last year um, was a devastating year for not only pelicans, but marine mammals. 90% um, of the fish that they eat along the West Coast plummeted. It, 
the pop. I think when we look back at 2015, it's going to be a marker year because if you take fish that are pretty close to the bottom of the food chain, the ripple effect on the animals that need that to survive, it's going to go on and on and on and on. It's the ripple effect. We, we haven't even, we've started feeling it. Um, and again, mostly small fish. And look how plentiful this was. And here's a guy, this was in the marina. And I've got another one. This was 2014. Look how many pelicans there are diving for fish in the creek. I did a pelican count last week. Audubon has it on the entire west coast. They do a pelican count once a year. In two hours, I saw one. Yeah, so the sixth mass extinction is happening really quickly and right under our noses. Uh, I wanted to point this out um, again. Notice the conduit. And this guy, um, this Greek, caught a, I can't remember the name of the fish, but it had a lot of spines. That's a huge fish for this bird. <laughs> and I wasn't sure if it was going to win, but the, the bird actually ended up winning. But I, I think it probably had digestive problems that night. <laughs> okay, the osprey. Look at these beautiful birds. Um, yeah, and um, these are vulnerable to extinction. They're on Oceana's watch list. One of the risks that they have, and it's, this is a growing cause of death, is the ospreys, they only eat fish. But what happens is, and I saw this in another bird species recently, they find the fishing line and they take it back to their nest to create the nest out of it. The chicks get tangled up in the nest and can't leave because it kills them. You know, they, they can't break free of it like they would if it was a twig or a, or a, a leaf or something. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty serious. This fishing, the hook, line, and sinker stuff is pretty serious. It's one of the main um, causes of death for these kinds of birds. Not just the osprey, but all the birds that I've shown you. Break free of it like they would if it was a twig. The sinker stuff is pretty serious. It's one of the main um, causes of death for these kinds of birds. Not just the osprey, but all the birds that I've shown you. Um, okay. Now, these, those were the long-legged wavers, the diving ducks. Now I'm just going to talk about the jetty peckers, the aquatic nibblers. Um, that's not a scientific term. The willet, yellow watch list. Again, this is out on the south jetty. You can kind of see a lot of mussels there that it's eating, eating through. Um, they, they go along the west coast and they breed in central Canada to northeast California and Nevada. Um, there are a few willets that live in the Biona wetlands area year round, uh, but most go to central Canada by spring. But there are some year round. And they, um, fish, spiders, crabs, worms, clams, other saltwater invertebrates. These are the black and ruddy turnstones. I'm still seeing the black turnstones. Again, these were from 2014. I haven't seen, I've seen very few ruddy turnstones, but I have seen them this year. Um, and their migration is uh, along the rocky shorelines and near the rocky coasts, and they winter here and, and as far south as south. South America. And um, again, invertebrates, crustaceans, barnacles, limpets. And I want you to, this is an oyster. I didn't know if you knew. We have lots of oysters that live on the, along the creek bed, or the creek banks, and out on the jetty, and on, in the marina and in the creek also. And just a couple of them together the two different species. And both of these are on the yellow watch list. Uh, marbled godwit on the yellow watch list. And 
this, what the yellow watch, what these watch lists mean is that without significant conservation action, they're going to be extinct. Oh. So yellow means not as bad as red, but it's still really not good. And they can be seen year-round also, but most migrate to breeding grounds or breeding grounds uh, in Central Plains and Saskatchewan and Minnesota. And the Wimbrel, also on the yellow watch list. Um, they winter in tidal flats and shorelines, and they eat marine invertebrates, especially small crabs, insects, and some even flowers during the breeding season. And they migrate, they can migrate, um, they breed in the Arctic tundra, and they migrate to South, South America, Africa, Asia, Australia. And so they have a long, a long flight. Audubon watch list, common bird in steep decline. I haven't seen any this year. I don't, ha, has anybody else seen any of these? How, have you seen very many? Yeah. And they have a unique call. Sometimes you can hear them calling. Yeah. And so I'm, again, the difference between 2014 and the last couple of years, I'm seeing fewer. Um, I, has that been your experience too, or not really? You're out more than I am. Yeah, yeah. And um, okay. And they breed above the timberline uh, by Alaskan mountain streams, and so they have totally different winter and summer homes. And the surf bird. Um, and they, they migrate to the mountain tundras of Alaska. And um, I still spot them here uh, year-round and further into the creek bed sometimes too. And the sanderlings, these are on the yellow watch list. I see them um, and I still spot them and occasionally further east along the creek. They migrate to the high Arctic tundra. So these guys have a, if, if they leave, they have a pretty long trip. And uh, eastward to the Baffin Islands, and um, they winter down the coast, clear to South America. And the, the, mus the crustaceans and the mollusks that are exposed along the tide lines. Black oyster catchers, again, these are on the yellow and the climate endangered watch list. Audubon has, um, co is considering these. In 2014, I think it was, they declared that these are a climate indicator, climate sensitive species. And so in northern or central California, they have a very active group that is vigilantly um, protecting their food areas, their, where they forage. And if you notice all the mussels, this, is, this was taken at the jetty in 2014. And this is taken almost at the top of the jetty. So you see how many mussels there are. And I consistently saw between four and six at a time in 2014. I see one or two at a time now. And it doesn't mean that they're not there. It's me, I'm not seeing them, which makes me nervous. Um, climate priority species. And it's considered an indicator for the health of the rocky intertidal shorelines. Um, and threats to this habitat are real and growing due to sea level rise, ocean acidification, and recreational fishing, and you'll see more of that in a minute. And here's just a couple more pictures of the oyster catcher and the American oyster catcher, which is actually on the red watch list. I've only seen the American oyster catchers in 2014. I haven't seen them since. Has well, actually, any, This one? Yeah, I think it was a hybrid. I don't know. It looks like, I mean, it could be. Could be. Um, so anyway, its diet is shellfish and marine invertebrates, including mussels and clams and, you know, all the things that grow on the jetties. You ready to meet the fishermen? Okay. Is everybody still awake? I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Um, there's more than you think. It's quite, whoops. 
I think this was the one I had trouble with last time. And um, this is not um, this is not illegal. They don't even have to have a license to go out and and uh, fish along the creek. It's not enforced. It's not regulated. And there's a lot of them. This was just only one part. Imagine the other side, equal amount. You know, so it, it, there's, there's, it's a very, very common activity. Um, and one of the things, in 2015, the star, and I mentioned this before, the sardines, anchovies, and the other fish that are the primary food sources for a lot of the birds that I showed are um, plummeted. And yet we're still allowing fishing of these, it's, it's like, this makes no sense to me. Um, so I think part of, not I think, one of the um, one of the objectives that I'm exploring, and I'm exploring it with whoever is interested, but also LMU, they've got um, a policy branch of their Center for Urban Resilience, and some other organizations that deal with policy stuff to see if we can do a case study, use some graduate students, and develop a new kind of model for leg legal stuff that has, right now it's kind of black white, you can have this many fish based on this condition between these months, period. Well, but if the fish are contaminated, it's a food source for the bridge. There's a number of variables that need to be considered and we can have dials on those laws so that we can create a new kind of modeling system for wildlife regulation. So I want to really explore some out-of-the-box out of thinking with these organizations, use it as a case study, and um, use data, facts and data, to see how it would actually work when it's enforced. Um, again, fishing line. What is it wrapped around? Mussels, fish food. So, a mess, just a mess. Is That's what a lot of this... I didn't even pick up the stuff that was wrapped up. I just picked up the stuff that was just laying there. I included this other, it's really hard to see, but this um, bird is trying to eat mussels that are wrapped around the fishing line, or fishing lines wrapped around it. So how about if, if you had to eat something and you had to go through all that stuff every time you wanted to feed yourself, it would be pretty daunting. And, look where they're standing, they notice the birds, and so guess what's getting discarded in this area? Um, very happy to be standing on that conduit. In addition, because the, the mussels have been wiped out by the fishermen off the jetties, they're moving up the creek because the mussels exist further up the creek as long as there's salt water. And so, I took this picture of this guy happily, he found a nice surface and happily putting all of his fishing stuff, but it's behind the reserve line, it's behind, it's, it's an area that you're not supposed to be. Here's another guy, look at this as a slideshow. I was out walking and I came across all these mussels that had just been harvested, still alive. And I turned around and I saw this guy behind me. I said, are these yours? And he just glared at me. And so I observed him picking them all up, putting them in a, his bucket, throwing his bike over the fence, the no trespassing fence, and going up the creek, presumably to fish. I don't know where it was going. So trespassing laws not enforced. Okay, this is the part that, that really is heartbreaking. I've shown you the birds how many of them feed on these mussels, and look what the fishermen are doing. This was almost up at the top of the jetty. See how many mussels there are there? If you go, and you know, it's a family affair, um, if you go there right now, you're not gonna see any mussels, except maybe a uh, low tide line. But they, it's just wiped off, there's seagrass where mussels used to be. And more of the same. Oh, and it's not just the mussels, it's the crabs that the birds eat. Mm -hmm. And I, I, these guys were having a great time, and this was at the, on the levee, the banks. 
not far from the conduit. And I, I said, what are you guys doing? Go, we're getting crabs. And they were just throwing something in this, in this cooler. Well, I could tell they were throwing something in, but it was like a lot of them. And I said, well, what are you doing? Uh, we're, we're catching crabs. I said, what are you going to do with them? Oh, we're going to fish. It's like, how many do you need? As many as we want. There's no regulation on this at all. And uh, I don't know if it's illegal or not. I don't think it's illegal. So, and again, this was out at the end of the jetty. This was actually the north jetty. But I was so stunned. This guy, you see this? This is a crab. This guy had his brother or friend or somebody in a wetsuit below the tide line, just kind of hand-picking all the crabs, putting them in and taking them home to eat. The crabs, all, the, all this fish food is um, toxic, so they shouldn't be eating it anyway, and if they're not eating it, they shouldn't be taking it anyway. You know, so it's compounding problems. Yeah? They used to post it along there as to not taking some of the shellfish and such, at least in certain times of the year. I haven't been around lately to know if they do that anymore. They, they do have some signs. Um, I've got photographs of them. I asked uh, one of the fishermen one time, I said, are you eating that? I said, have you seen that sign over there? He goes, it's okay, I looked it up online. I can eat one of these a month. <laughs> so I went, wow, okay. So here's the other catch that they do. Fishing hooks, lines, sinkers. This fisherman here actually caught the pelican and was reeling it in, the wing, his wing, and then cut it off. Cut, wow. And, okay. The oh. cut off the fishing line. I don't know if he got the hook or not, oh. but he want, he just wanted it off of his line because oh. the bird was trying to fish also because that's where <laughs> the fish were. So, okay, so this guy, look at that wingspan, isn't that gorgeous? Um, this guy, have you guys seen the pelicans when they dive for fish? It's just spectacular. And what I found out is um, they can hit the surface with such force that it stuns fish within six feet. And so they just float up. That's, remember the, the picture that I had with the pelican that had all this fish in its thing? That's because the fish were kind of loopy. And that's why you'll see gulls circle around where the pelicans are because the fish just kind of get dumb. So this guy was going in sideways and he was doing dances. What's wrong with that guy? And then as he flew past me, I saw these sinkers, and what was happening is he probably had a hook in his belly, and when he'd go in, it would pull. He would have to. So, just heartbreaking. Just a few more photos. This poor gull was, was so, it had a hook here, it had a hook up there, it was completely wrapped around. Anytime it would move one limb, another limb would move. It could fly, but it was not, it was not gonna, it couldn't, I don't know how it could eat. This guy, this moon, was just, had a hook in kind of its upper thing, and it was trying so hard, I think it was losing its ability to control that leg, and I watched it circle around and around and try to get it out for over an hour. This guy, if you see, the fishing line actually goes behind its neck and over its beak, these need to extend their neck in order to eat the fish. There's no way it was going to be able to eat. Perfectly beautiful, healthy bird. A few more examples. Um, this one uh, wrapped all over the place. This one, again, its bill was cut up. This gorgeous, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name, Surf scooter had fishing line. I could I could get so close to it, but they're wild now. You know they're wild, so they won't. They don't trust you. Who who could blame them? So it had fishing line all over its body, um, and I don't know how many hooks were in there. I couldn't tell. Um, so and there's another image I have. I didn't include it, which was um, 
one of the red-breasted mergansers actually caught a fish, but it had a hook holding its beak together because the fish probably, it couldn't swallow the fish it had. And again, it was, try, it was trying to swallow for at least an hour. It was, broke my heart. So that concludes that part. But I mentioned hopeful, hopeful vigilance. We can do something about this. We can restore the habitat. We can change the laws. We can put a moratorium on the fishing and the take laws. We can model new laws. We can do outreach and we can definitely increase the signage. So I believe that we can fix it. Uh, it's all local. Even though we're in the midst of the six mass extinction, if we clean our little pearl up and do some things that are reflect 21st century reality because a lot of the laws, they were, they were written 50, 100 years ago. The reality, if you had said, oh, there aren't gonna be any fish left, there aren't gonna be any birds left, it's all gonna be poison, they, nobody would have believed you. And so a lot of the work is gonna be in upgrading policies to reflect today's reality. And so, moratorium on fishing and take, until the moratorium is in place, and until it's left, uh, maybe do some innovative things on collecting um, the fishing line that's discarded. Uh, I am in discussion with a group up in uh, the Bay Area, and hopefully I will be able to connect by voice tomorrow, where they actually got a grant to send to pay scuba divers and others to collect all the fishing line, and they're measuring it to see how bad of the problem it is, and if it's going, what is it trending? Is it trending up or trending down, and what is the harm? So we can do that. We can, I saw somebody suggest um, in the International Bird Rescue, again, they, they were rescuing this bird that had a hook in its neck, and they, were, they placed the x-ray on it, or they, they put an x-ray up on their uh, Facebook feed and um, said this one, it made it, we, we caught this one and it's going to be okay. But it showed the bird post-surgery just kind of knocked out, it was sad. But someone said, maybe we can make fishing line that dissolves, fishing hooks that <coughs> dissolve after a certain amount of time. So, the, so let's be innovative, it's a problem, what can we do? But mostly we need to not fish right now. Um, Add more garbage cans. Put more signage up. These birds are, are extinct. Put um, multiple languages. Yeah. Multiple yeah. languages. Yeah. And um, and again, this right here. That's the only area this was from. All these pictures were taken right in this area, except for the nests. The nests are <coughs> over here. But um, put more signage. And and enforce the littering. We can use littering laws, we can use uh, trespassing laws, enforce those, but I also wanna see mandatory eco-education classes, and I'm not talking about one hour, I'm talking about a 12-week series that whoever got the fine, they have to pay to go. And if they miss it, they get in even worse trouble. So it's mandatory, they have to go through these and have a whole series so that by the end, they really have the full scope of the wildlife, and let me one one more thing. And in addition to the mandatory eco education, I want mandatory eco community hours. And again, not just one hour. I want like twelve weeks, two three hours each time, and have them rotate through wildlife rehabilitation, habitat restoration, signage. If the signs get graffitied, they have to. And again. You know, so it gives them a different way to engage in the outdoors and really come to understand this in a different way other than fishing. Um, and so that, and I've mentioned it taking the existing laws and really doing some analysis on, and some out of the box thinking on how we can do this better. So that, that pretty much concludes my, yes. In a more positive light, if the education were in the schools, the children of the fishermen could shame them. I would love to get this in schools. I, yes. It be mandatory in all the schools. And the younger the child, the more yep. their hearts are open. And yep. they will just say, you can't do that, Dad. It yep. would change everything.
Yeah. 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 And so I, I would be delighted. I would like to get a grant to do that. Yes. So I can, I too can eat. <laughs> so, um, so that's pretty much um, uh, what it is. I want to build a coalition for creating 21st century rules, regulations, and outreach to address these things and design some really, um, some policies and some, some mindsets that, that is going to take us through the next century, which is going to be a, a rough and tumble century. So thank you for listening. Thank you.